Hello everybody and welcome to another spoiler review. Today we're going to go over a classic. And that is Demon World by Ben Counter. Now, this came out when I was a kid still. I read it then. It was 2003. Looking it up, there seems to have been a bunch of more reprints. So a lot of people must have read this book. And it's got four different fucking covers. Anyway... I've still got the original one because I'm awesome. It's one of the few books I actually got left that I didn't sell on eBay for beer money. So <laughs> I think it was just because it wasn't in the box with the rest of them. It was somewhere else. Anyway, this novel is one of the best novels to cover with 40k in terms of uh, science fiction, in terms of chaos, in terms of covering lore that isn't normally explored. This was one of my favourite ones because it was unique. Uh, this isn't space marines shooting orcs. This isn't noble people fighting against evil baddies. This is 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 a really complex story. Um, I think it's probably one of Ben Cantor's best. Uh, I am a fan of soul drinkers, but I think a lot of people admit that it got a bit ropey towards the end. Started off strong, middle was good. Uh, I think he might have lost his way. But that's a chat for another time. Still good. Better than I could do. <laughs> but um, yeah, this this book is fantastic. And if you can hear me rustling the pages, it's because I've actually got it in my hand. Yeah, it's... <sighs> how to explain it? I'm just trying to think of how to cover it best. Okay, so this was made when Black Library was still a young organisation. It's one of their first... In the first few years, they did this, and Ben Counter was one of their f original writers. They probably had like, with, with Dan Abner and stuff. Yeah, it's it's high quality. It's 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 fantastic story. It's <laughs> the, and there's so much stuff that's come from this, and then being sort of embraced within the rest of the law. That um, yeah, you definitely need to read it if you haven't, and if you want to understand uh, the Maelstrom, um, that other warp rift that isn't the Eye of Terror. And, uh, yeah, there's the nature of chaos, of service with chaos. And just to see some awesomeness, you know, uh, this this is the book for you. Oh, and Ben Counter as well. Ben Counter's one of their best writers. He, he He's a good guy. He's, he does some good stuff. Again, I think the Soul Drinkers went a bit off the rails towards the end. But I'm still a fan. <laughs> but this was written in 2003. You know how old that makes me feel. It's disgusting. I am 30 years old now. So that's... I was 16 or 15. Jesus Christ. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> we will do some spoilers now. But if you are interested in it... I will uh, put a link below. Also, please remember to go over to audible.com using my link and you can get a copy of a Black Library audiobook of your choice for freeze. So, let's do some spoilers for Demon World. Explain the story and some of the awesomeness. So this story has several protagonists, several characters that it revolves around, but all of it is periphery, really, to the one main character who is instigating everything. One, Argulion Vec, which I might be massacring, but we'll call him Vec from now on. Vec is an ancient human being, a champion of chaos from the very dawn of human history, in, or at least <clears throat> expansion into the stars. He says himself that he's one of the main reasons for the existence of the Maelstrom. And you got to kind of believe that because of other stuff that, that comes up in the book. Basically, during the Dark Age of Technology, he and the Age of Strife, of course, he appears to have been one of the first to embrace chaos somehow. And this guy's story needs to be told, you know? I mean, if they're going to go back and do the Unification Wars and stuff, this is a really nice thing to uh, cover as well as a sort of side arc for the law, I think they should really go back and uh, rediscover this character and put some bones on him because, yeah, he's he's really important, but 
he does he's, he's not he doesn't pop up in anything else and I really want him to pop up in something else. Just a mention. Just a mention. That's all I want. <laughs> When I read this when I was a kid, I thought this was one of the coolest things ever because it, it is, it's it's awesome. I'm I'm trying to think now how best to I'll tell it like that or tell it like that. Okay, we'll just tell it a nice simple way and keep this reasonably short because uh, I know a lot of you probably have read this and if you haven't, I definitely recommend picking it up. It's a nice read. It's It's awesome, to be fair. And you can see a lot of the stuff in this book is then built upon by subsequent chaos stuff it's influenced the the other stuff that's been done afterwards not to say that it's the only influence at all but you can definitely see how uh it's 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 probably been knocking around people's minds because a lot of people read this because it was one of the first novels right so vec was one of these first champions he helped build the eye uh, the maelstrom even Wrong, wrong warp rift, sorry. He ended up on the planet of Torvendus. Now, Torvendus is a maiden world, and an Eldar maiden world. And when their civilization collapsed at the birth of Slanesh, this was one of the maiden worlds which resisted. But a number of the other maiden worlds around the area um, fell to chaos as well. I'm not too sure that that's linked exactly, but there's got to be a link somewhere. Basically, he uh, was then a servant of the chaos and at the behest of the gods, he went there and conquered this place for them, enslaving the spirit of the planet and turning it to the powers of chaos. It was inhabited by people, by humans, and we'll get to them shortly. And Eldar before then, obviously. It appears at some point he started to lose faith in the chaos gods, what they had turned him into, the monster he had become. He's obviously a psyker of some description. He's a sorcerer. And he seems to be disgusted with himself at what he became, what they turned him into, with his own using his own emotions against him, and the things he'd done. When he was a warlord, when he was this great champion, he had an amazing ship called the Slaughter Song, which is a relic from the Dark Age of Technology. It's controlled by AI. It's super advanced. It's the, the bollocks, basically. And he left it there, in the sky. And as the millennia have gone by, the savage inhabitants of that planet have started to... It, it's become part of their cosmological knowledge, uh, as if it's a star, because it's been in orbit so long, and it's so large and bright. And even to... No one's bothered investigating it, <laughs> which is... It, it's perfectly possible. And he might have had some kind of cloaking thing or whatever. He doesn't discuss it. But it has become a part of the local system. You know, it's just an object that floats around and appears in the sky and people see it. And when the word bearers show up, they haven't even bothered investigating it. They just think it's like some planetary object. It's not even of interest to them. <laughs> then again, it could probably defend itself if anyone came and tried to take it, so... Yeah, they call it his steed, which I think is a nice touch. It's like some kind of mythical memory that's kept within the tribes. And these people are probably the descendants of the armies that he led. Um, in fact, we know some of them are. Well, we'll get to that in shortly. He loses faith with these guys, and he goes off wandering the maelstrom to look at it with new eyes, I think he says. And, yeah, he starts to turn against chaos and starts to figure out a way to gain revenge. Anyway, eventually he finds himself in joining the uh, the word bearers. Now, he kind of says it like he becomes an Astartes or takes on the look of an Astartes or something because he has armour, which I believe is power armour. But whatever way he does, he joins with the word bearers and he's with them for a time. Now, whether he's just infiltrating them to learn their knowledge or he's still in with chaos, but he's having doubts. And then when he finally leaves, he's pursued by a kill team of pretty awesome word bearers to be honest uh, they've got one sniper guy there and everything it's it's, it's really good it's an excellent little um, there's like three stories going on at once basically and uh, they intertwine but they're all working to his plan right since he left Torvendus or Torvendis however you pronounce it the world has be because the world sits at the centre of the maelstrom, it's sort of apparently at the uh, the nexus of all the warp energy and stuff, <laughs> and stuff. And basically, whoever's champion controls Torvendus, 
the the gods that they serve will gain a big boost, basically, in power or souls or whatnot because of how the warp works, how the tides of the warp work. And it's a sort of natural point where everything swirls around it. And, yeah, so whoever controls it, their god gets a boost and it's sort of like they're winning the great game. And it's passed from warlord to warlord, champion to champion, who's managed to conquer the world. At the moment... At the moment, it's controlled by a Slaneshi champion uh, called Lady Charybdis, and um, she has a force of Space Marines, a renegade Space Marine chapter, who have got like three companies with them called the Violators, and I think they've popped up in other bits and bobs since this came out. Uh, which is a nice touch, you know. I like to see the books linked to other stuff, so it's all this big world. And yeah, she rules this planet. Now, uh, the peripheries in sort of mountains and so on, there is uh, sort of barbarian tribes. So think marauders. They're they're, uh, chaos-worshipping barbarian tribes. Other than that, the whole world is dominated by her. And she also keeps control of these barbarian tribes by giving gifts to the chiefs and stuff. And one of these tribes is the Emerald Sword, I think. Blatantly going to check that. (laughs) Yeah, so... Um, and they have a fortress in the mountains, which is sort of like their ancestral home that they were kicked out of by uh, Lady Charybdis when she tried to pacify and break their power in the region. And she hasn't bothered hunting them down to extinction or anything. She just keeps the chief uh, in thrall. She gave him a uh, demonette to play with, basically. Being one of the uh, the descendants of Vex, original conquering host. They were given a mighty sword, and this sword binds the world planet. In the end, the drive is to have that sword pulled forth, and the energies released in it will destroy Torvendus, or set it free so it can destroy itself, which is, of course, what it does at the end. And that's Vec's final fuck you to the Chaos Gods. You know, I'm taking your gift from you. And it's the only way you can take some vengeance on them. But there's a lot of stuff that happens before then. So let's cover it off quickly. He flees the word bearers and heads to Torvendus. Clearly with this in mind. And he's obviously been planning it. He lands on the planet and finds a young tribesman called Golgoth. Basically he, he appears to him as an ancient sorcerer. He's used a knife to cut off his own flesh, which is a pretty awesome little scene. And, um, yeah, he um, he encourages him to take over the tribe, and after many trials and tribulations, he does. And he launches a war against Lady Charybdis to take the city back. But in the end, it appears to be, that's just a distraction, I think, to stop her seeing what the rest is going on, or to distract the gods, that this is just your normal flow of events on the planet, and someone's attempted to take it over. Anyway, it ends uh, up with the world becoming covered in blood because a bloodthirster who used to rule the planet is resurrected. Oh, okay. So basically, this Lady Charybdis is mining the various strata of the planet's crust, which are layer upon layer of dead bodies and destruction from all of the different wars that have been fought there. I mean, you're talking hundreds of wars, you know. Hundreds of champions have taken over. There's been untold death and destruction on the world. And she's she's using it to create, like... Because she's, like, a hedonist, you know, Slaneshi. She's after the... Uh, it, it'll, it'll get her really high, basically, by drudging up these things, you know, the sensations, the power radiating from them, from digging up demon bones and stuff. Um, but um, she... The demon uh, Shal Shakar is <laughs> resurrected, and it's pretty nice what he does there. He's a, a grey clockwork uh, brass demon of corn, and he has a whole demonic army. And uh, yeah, it ends up with like the city getting like flooded with blood, and battles going on uh, along the rooftops and stuff with demons and tribesmen charging lines of these violator space marines who uh, are traitor marines, but like they're disciplined and stuff. And the Slaneshi armies as well. It's it's a really nice mix of stuff. You know, there's people getting killed by spears and also getting shot to pieces by a dreadnought. You know, it's it's good stuff. It's, it's a good old romp. There is a confrontation between Vec and the 
word bearers kill team who have been sent after him and basically kills them all one by one by using some of the relic weapons and armor that he's left on slaughter song and they've just been sat there and the slaughter song itself helping him because it, he's its master um i think it says he found the ship so he didn't build it or anything he, he found this relic and it bound it to him but yeah basically it ends with through his planning and so on the young Golgoth going off and drawing the sword and bringing about the destruction of the planet and I'll read a small segment and the, so the planet's known as the last because it's the last of the maiden worlds within the maelstrom I believe Argilon Vec looked down on the city directly beneath him as the last moor closed towers splintered beneath the crushing teeth demons died as the city fell down a mighty roar rising up in a cloud of debris. Vec could see Shakar clinging to the top of Charybdia Keep, raging insanely and showering blood, lashing out with steel claws at the fangs which bore down on him. The whole city was gone now, crushed beneath a canopy of mountainous teeth, with only Shakar visible. His huge body was transfixed by a dozen points that sunk into his flesh and came out the other side holding him fast, Still he bellowed, brass skull shaking with anger as the moor sank into the ground. And it goes on. The last didn't speak as such, but it had been given intelligence by the Eldar, who at their height had mastered psychic engineering, and it could talk directly with a man's soul. It was in agony. It had been that way since the day Vec had defeated it a hundred lifetimes ago. It had been violated as the powers of chaos took the planet as a symbol of their power, infected with its war dead and soaked in corrupted blood. Its stones had been ground down and incorporated into terrible temples and bastions that rang with the screams of the tormented into the very city it had just reabsorbed into its body. It had been suffering most terribly, and it had been driven insane. Torvendus, last of the Eldar maiden worlds, wanted revenge just as much as Argalon Vect. Revenge against chaos, which was such a vast and all-consuming power that only the grandest gestures could hurt the gods. Only the loss of a symbol like Torvendus would be enough for them to notice. Vec and the last had fought the most terrible battle of the Maelstrom's long history, but now, when they had both had so much time to contemplate what had happened, they understood. The last did not hate Vec, though Vec had imprisoned it and introduced it to its torment. It hated chaos. Vec, for his part, knew the last was still a maiden world imbued by the Eldar who had lived there with a consciousness of its own, so it could be as beautiful and productive as possible. It still valued beauty and justice, and understood the value of sacrifice in the face of evil. It was mad, but those beliefs had not left it. The only way it could hurt chaos was to be destroyed. Argalon Vec, a different man from the one who had defeated it, had led it free to accomplish this. For this, at least, it found space in its rage to be grateful. It also understood that Argalon Vect did not expect or particularly want to survive, so it was with little ceremony that, with a final roar of rage from its very core, Torvendus tore itself apart. Now, that sums up the end, and that is a real spoiler. It's a great book. Uh, the character of Vec is really... I want more. I still want more. I want more as soon as I finish reading this, and I can't believe they haven't done anything with the character. He needs to be brought back. Something needs to be done with him. But um, whether he's alive in the current universe, I think probably, you know, the gods aren't going to let him die. They need to punish him for what he's done. But there we go. It's, It's a great... It's a great section, and at the time as well, the Maelstrom had pretty much bugger all written about it. It was just there. So this was a a, a lovely, lovely uh, enhancement and enrichment of the law. But yeah, fantastic book, fantastic read, and I highly recommend it. Okay, with that, I will leave you to it. Thanks very much for watching. I have been the Border Prince, and I will see you next time. Cheers. (laughs) 